Well, welcome again, folks who are here and folks who are online. Isn't it great to see that energy of those little ones? Man, that is just fantastic. Don't you wish you could kind of bottle that and uh, take that now and then? <laughs> Fabulous. Well, we continue our series, Planting Seeds of Faith, and this morning we're looking at Behold, I Make All Things New. We are in Revelations chapter 21, and this is a word from the risen Lord to John, who is on the Isle of Patmos. He's exiled there, and the risen Lord appears to him and gives him a word to him and also to all the churches down through the ages. And so 5 through 7 says this, And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. May the Lord bless this word to our hearts and minds this morning. Well, uh, I don't know how many of you tuned in to the inauguration this week. Uh, there are, were a number of firsts. This was the first virtual inauguration. That wasn't actually a surprise since we've done so many virtual things over the course of the last 12 months or so. But, but there were some other things too. This was the first time we've had an official podium sanitizer. Uh, did, you, did you see that? We were waiting going, okay, what's going on? And it turns out there's somebody sanitizing between all the, the speakers. And um, then we saw Bernie Sanders and his homemade mittens. I guess that was, you know, one of the, the top things. We, of course, welcomed in a new vice president, Kamala Harris, who was also the first woman vice president and the first woman of color vice president. Of course, we heard uh, the new president, Joe Biden, uh, give a word of inspiration, insight. And then also my favorite moment was the poet laureate, um, uh, the youngest ever, Amanda Gorman, who just uh, wowed all of us with words of inspiration, and not just the poetry, but the delivery, and it was, it was beautiful. And uh, I'm, I'm a history buff, and I love these, these moments, and um, I watched Purdue's Lamb School of Communication. They had some great things on there, and a uh, number of the presentations. One of them was uh, all the elections in history that have been contested. Turns out we have a long, rich history of doing that sort of thing. So, and we've managed to get through all of it. And there was all kinds of trivia. And, and I don't know about you, but whether you're a Republican or Democrat or Tea Party Libertarian or other of some sort. There's something special about inaugurations and the history of inaugurations and, and looking at that. I'm reminded of some of the humorous moments in inaugurations. Uh, there was John F. Kennedy's podium that caught on fire. Do you recall that? You can look it up in the internet. Um, Cardinal Cushion was doing the invocation, and the podium started to, to smoke and apparently got on fire. And so the police got down on their knees while he was praying and tried to put this out so it would be ready for the president uh, to get up and give his speech. So there was some, some humor in that. Um, uh, Eisenhower was lassoed, uh, and uh, I didn't see that one, but I, I've heard about it. And uh, th then there was, in the Clinton inauguration, there was an Elvis impersonator. So, uh, and, and that was kind of interesting. There's also been the moments that were really incredible to me, probably the greatest moment that I recall so uh, well as a, as a very young person was when John F. Kennedy said, uh, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And he went on to challenge us in the space race, which was uh, exciting and thrilling, and it was just, uh, it, was a, it was a beautiful moment. And so, as we think about inauguration and all that it symbolizes, however you voted, whatever party that you're from, there's something about uh, something new and the unfolding of an inauguration where we let go of the old and we take a step into the new. And there is an anticipation about the future, and there's also sort of a, a nervousness. And as I was reflecting on that this week, I'm reminded that our Lord also is a great inaugurator. And this word this morning, uh, from the risen Lord who says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, I am the beginning and the end, God is still at work. And so this is the risen Lord. John is uh, on the Isle of Patmos. He has been exiled there. And in this moment, 
later in life, he has this incredible vision from the risen Lord and given the revelations. And he's given a word to various churches throughout the ages, not just at that time. And this is one of those words, behold, I'm making all things new. And so reflecting on that this morning and thinking about all the time in Jesus' life where he was making things new, uh, recall that Jesus said, you can't put new wine in old wineskins, right? And he called people to new things in their life, new directions. The disciples needed to cast their nets on the other side, and they need to take a, a new step and follow him, and he would make them fishers of men. Uh, Jesus said to other people, go and sin no more, and to others, go down to the Jordan River and take a dip and you will see calling us into something new in life. But I think the most important thing is really is that the first thing is not something new, but letting go of the old. And that may well be the most difficult. There's a great book out called Managing Transitions by William Bridges. And Bridges makes this big point with a, a lot of studying. He says, frankly, it isn't just about not being able to do something new. He says, you can't do it at all unless you learn to let go of the old. And that by far is the most difficult thing. And so as you think about that today, uh, not just in the inauguration, but in a, in a new year, what maybe do you need to let go of before you can go on to the new? Maybe there's an old habit. Maybe there's a, a broken relationship. Um, maybe there is something that's failed in the past that you need to just let go of. What do you need to let go of? What do you need to let go of that you can move on to the new? Last week, we looked at the parable of the barren fig tree, and we talked about how that the uh, landowner was touring with the gardener and found this fig tree that hadn't bore fruit in three years. And he said, listen, you go ahead and cut it down. But the gardener said, wait a second, give me another year and let me dig around the roots and let me put manure on it. And we talked about how you had to sometimes go through digging around the roots, and sometimes that's painful, but sometimes that's letting go of the old, and, and sometimes the new, sometimes it involves sort of manure in our life and things that, that don't feel right, but we need to do that in order to move on to the new. And so in your life right now, what old habit do you need to let go of? What burden are you sort of carrying around from the past that you need to just put down at the foot of the cross and give it to Jesus? What do you need to let go of today? Jesus partners with us. The Lord Almighty partners with us so that we can let go of the old. The second thing that God does is to give us a vision of the future. Jesus was all the time doing that, talking about the faith that is like a seed that's planted like a mustard seed that's the smallest in the garden, and yet grows to the biggest tree that even the birds of the air can roost on it. And Jesus was always casting a vision, inviting those who couldn't see to see. In fact, throughout Scripture, this has always been a theme. Think for a moment about David who was the smallest of the sons of Jesse, and yet God saw something bigger and greater, a king one day. Think about Esther for a moment, who was from a very humble family, who was not part of the rich and the famous and the royal elite, and yet she became a queen, a queen, by the way, who interceded for the people of Israel and prevented the genocide that was about to take place. God saw that in Esther. God saw something greater in David. This past week, we celebrated Martin Luther King Jr. Day on Monday, and uh, we're reminded of Dr. King's vision, a dream that he had from reading Isaiah and the Psalms and even uh, Christ himself about a vision, a dream that was greater than what we were experiencing now. And God opened his eyes, according to Martin Luther King Jr., to see a time when people will be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character, calling us to a new, greater vision. Now, we've achieved a lot, but we still have more to do in terms of racial equality and equality for all the genders and equality for, for everyone. But we're working together, and that vision calls us forward, that dream calls us forward. But I think it's also about our individual lives. What dreams is God trying to bring to you today for the future? If you let go of the past for a moment, but all the things that kind of weighed you down, what would the Lord call you to as a new vision, 
a new ministry, uh, a new kind of prayer life, a new faith that opens up, new relationships, new ministries, new things, new gifts and talents that you could develop together with God. So God partners with us to let go of the old, and God partners with us to see a vision of the future, and then God partners with us to take a first step. Today, in just a few moments, we're going to celebrate the baptism of little Chet Allen, who's full of all kinds of energy today. And um, Maggie J. and Matt had a couple verses that they wanted to share with him, and I think also with us. And we'll be reminded of those again later, but two great verses that I love. And I know that part of what they want to do is to inspire him towards the best and to realize that God has a plan and purpose in his life and that he doesn't have to do it alone, that God is helping him take those steps, even as they will help him take his first steps in life, right? God is like that with his children, with us, with you and I. And so in Ephesians 2.10, It says this, for we are God's masterpiece, masterpiece, God's work of art created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Not to earn God's love, but in return for God's love. We are God's masterpiece. Turn to the person next to you and said, you are a masterpiece. (laughs) And now turn to the person you were avoiding and say that same thing. (laughs) And listen. Listen. How about just taking a moment and whisper it to yourself today? And I challenge you throughout the course of this week. Maggie J. and Matt put a lot of thought on this because I think that's really important for little Chet Allen to realize, and all all the kids too, and all of us, and that we're not doing it alone. We're created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God is preparing for us. God is working us. And then... uh, as you know, one of my favorite verses as well, they wanted to share, Jeremiah 29, 11, I can't hear it too much, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. You know, a lot of folks have been raised and they kind of thought that God was maybe a police officer out to bust you, and not the police officer that kind of helps you along the way, but God's just sort of waiting with a checklist to see what you do wrong. The truth is God is partnering with us to create a new future. God wants us to let go of the past. Uh, Christ, his work on the cross has brought us forgiveness and grace, reminded us of God's love, and God's Holy Spirit is empowering us to take that step in our life that will lead us into the future. What step does God want you to take today and in this year to bring that new vision to life? What are the things in your life that God is opening the door to? Now, like all of us, you know, we have some some trepidation, but I'm reminded throughout Scripture some of the great steps. I'm reminded of Abraham and Sarah just when they were young. And God called Abraham to a place that he didn't know about and really didn't know when he got there. But Abraham and Sarah were willing to take that first step. When Jesus came to the disciples after telling them to try the other side of the boat, He said, why don't you try a whole new lifestyle, for if you follow me, I will make you fishers of men. But they had to take that first step. What is God calling you to in the steps of your life that can just open the door to that? I want to think for a moment about the first inauguration, which you may know, which was our first president, George Washington. And some of the scholars debate this, and you can do that over brunch, but We're told as uh, George Washington was taking that first inaugural oath that uh, when he got to the end, he knelt down and he kissed the Bible and said, so help me God, so help me God. And you know, I think that's true for all of us, that whatever steps that we take in life, it's pretty hard to do without God. But if we utter those same words from that first inauguration, so help me God, and realize that God is calling us into the new, that Jesus is the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, and that God can bring something new. I'm going to close with this thought. A sad thing happened this week, which was the great Hank Aaron passed away at 86, lived a long and great life. And of course, he eclipsed Babe Ruth's long-term held record of lifetime home runs, which was 715. 
And a lot of people were really upset because Babe Ruth was such a, which was such a legendary figure in the Yankees, but all in all of baseball. And so as he's coming up on that home run uh, record, he actually faced some hate mail, uh, but then people got over it and then they just celebrated. In fact, I, I watched the rerun that Vince Skelly uh, gave the play-by-play as he hit that home run uh, just this week to sort of refresh it. It was just this amazing, amazing moment and uh, he had such grace and such dignity, and then people kind of let go. Uh, Babe Ruth will always be great, but then there was Hank Aaron, and he's such a sort of a, a person of grace and uh, wonder. And, and it helped us, I think, you know, continue to work on uh, racial inequality. He was a great spokesperson for that. And he did it in such a humble, beautiful way. Well, then came the moment uh, in 2007 when Barry Bonds broke Hank Aaron's home run record, of course, uh, Hank Aaron was around for that. There was some debate over that because um, Barry Bonds was rumored to take some um, performance-enhancing substances and later actually admitted to it. But you know, the first person to congratulate him was Hank Aaron. He had this beautiful piece, which is also on the internet, which I highly recommend. And he goes on to say, Congratulations, but he also said, you know, from the first day that I broke that record, and when I set that, I think it was 755 was the final number in his legendary career, he said, I always knew that some child, black or white, would break it one day, and I would be cheering them on. I would be cheering them on. And I think in our own lives, we need to realize that the old is great. There's a lot of things about that. But God has a new vision for a new day. God is still at work in all the world. And God has a vision for us. And God has a plan and purpose to call us into the future. And God will help us take those steps to get us there. And so I ask you today to think about for a moment what God would have you leave behind to lay at the foot of the cross. And then to catch a vision not only of the risen Lord, but the dream that God would call you into today and in this new year, new chapters of your life, but to realize you don't do it alone because God takes each of us by the hand, even as parents do their kids, and walks us to the next chapter of life. So today, hear those words from the risen Lord, the one who is calling us into a new inauguration of our lives Behold, I'm making all things new. Amen. Lord, as we think about this moment as we're walking into a new year, new chapter of history, that you're constantly calling us forward, but we don't do it alone. You help us to lay down the baggage of our life and the burdens of the day, the failures of the past, and you wipe them away. You call us to a new vision, a new dream, a new way of using our gifts and talents in ministry and service of you and others. And then you help us along the way of life. So today, help us to hear your voice, your whisper calling to us, behold, I'm making all things new and to follow you. In Christ's name, And all God's people said...